organisms. But of course, that organism has been evolving all this time in its environment, and it's doing things in quite a bit different way than it probably was when you first got it 50,000 years before. And so how well can you really understand how it parses its environment? Because really, truly, to understand its nervous system, you have to also understand what its nervous system is, is paying attention to it's in its environment. So you also have to look at things like its behavior and its ecology as well. And, and while this is a really funny thought experiment, and, and this picture is hilarious of these cavemen eating at a dinner table, it's actually not that far-fetched. This is actually what we do every day. Even I do it in my lab with this particular species. This is actually Drosophila melanogaster that we know is a very, very important model system in biology, that we have an immensely tractable genetic system. We can mutate almost every gene in their body and try to figure out what it does. We can parse their nervous system. We know exactly how many neurons are in its brain, and we have a connectome for its, its, its brain already where we know what, what neurons are there and where they're connected to. We have so much information about the species, but yet we've been keeping it in these containers for 2000 generations. And now we're trying to understand what its brain actually does, but it's been kept outside of its, it's actually the, the very environment that it was evolved to try to understand. So that's really what we try to do. We try to understand how organisms actually behave in their natural environments first before we try to understand how their nervous systems work. So we start outside in environments like this. This is Kashmir. This is one of our field sites way up in the, in the Himalayas. And so that's why we're called the NICE Lab. Um, it's a funny name, but the meaning is that we are naturalist inspired. All of our research starts out in the environments where these animals live. So we work on everything from, excuse me, I'm just turning my phone off. I thought I had turned it off. Uh, everything from uh, scent marking and tigers to understanding integrated pest management and coffee plantations and how insect pests find coffee plants to understanding how pollinators survive at high altitudes to also working on black buck and how black buck use chemical cues to interest each other. So all of these techniques require us to first go out into these environments and understand how these animals are actually behaving in their natural environment, then take them back to the lab as we can. We can't do that so easily with tigers, but with some of the other experiments we can, and then trying to understand how their brains process the information. And one of the most important, I would say, things that an animal does in its environment is object identification, right? In order to eat, you have to know what food is and what is the food that you're supposed to be eating, right? You don't want to confuse an apple with a table and eat the wrong thing. So you have to be able to identify things. And we take this so for granted, actually, but it's an incredibly complicated technique. Um, if any of you have had any experience with, you know, machine learning or deep learning techniques, which often really are focused on identifying objects, you know how complicated it is in the complex natural world for us to identify things. Um, you know, we've gotten really, really great with facial recognition software, but yet even the facial recognition software doesn't necessarily identify a face the way our brains identify faces, which is why facial recognition software generally doesn't identify faces in animals. It identifies human faces because that's how it was trained. So you see, object identification is very important. It's also very essential for survival, and it's also very, very, very difficult. So I'm gonna tell you four really quick stories of about object identification using some of the research from our lab. And, and the first I'm gonna talk about is that object identification is, um, shaped by an organism's ecology and environment. And this makes a lot of sense, I think, that the type of objects that any animal or any brain of any animal would identify are the result of its ecology, right? So you, you can imagine that a fruit fly probably doesn't care much about your computer screen because it has no reason to identify computers. In fact, I don't know what it would think about a computer screen. In fact, if it would even think anything at all, other than that it's a large, obstacle that it has to avoid running into. 
So the, I, the kinds of objects that an, that an organism will identify and therefore the way its nervous system processes those objects is entirely dependent on its ecology. So for this example, I want to take you to the Himalayas, to the, uh, an area called Sikkim, where I worked with a wonderful neuroethologist. Her name is Karen Nordstrom. She is a professor at Flinders University, which is in Adelaide, Australia. And she works on this very cute little insect. This is called a hoverfly. So hoverflies are a type of fly. They're obviously related to, to Drosophila in that they're diptera. They're in the same family of insects, but they look quite a bit different and they look a lot more like wasps or bees. They can't sting because they're flies, but they, they are actually prolific pollinators. In fact, they are the most numerous pollinators on the planet. They're not the best pollinator because uh, that would be bees. Bees are much better pollinators than flies, but there's more of them. So they, they actually do a huge amount of pollination across the world, including way, way up here where we are at nearly 4,000 meters in, in elevation in, in North Sikkim. So we wanted to know this. How do they identify flowers when they exist all over the world? And when I mean all over the world, I mean actually all over the world. This particular species that I showed you, which is called Episurface baltiatus, is found almost on every continent except for Antarctica. And these are pictures I took with my own iPhone camera in central Sweden, in central Germany, in Bangalore, where I'm based, and even up in the Himalayas. The same species identifying flowers. And now it may seem obvious to you that a, a fly that pollinates flowers should identify flowers, obviously. But think about it. Think about how different the flowers are between these different environments. The, the flowers in Bangalore and the flowers in, in the Himalayas and the flowers in Sweden would be very, very different from each other. Different smells, different colors, different shapes, just as, as a rose and a daisy look nothing alike. So this idea of how these pollinators are actually able to parse this information and identify flowers across these different environments becomes very, very interesting. And I'm trying to understand how their brains might, might detect this information. So in order to find out what kinds of cues that they might use to identify flowers in these different environments, we went and we measured them. So my team and, and Karin's team went to the, each of these different environments and we gathered as many cues as we could about these different flowers that these flies were interested in. So for example, this is a flower, right? This is the primrose you can see here. Um, it, it, has a, it has a shape, it has a pattern, it has a, a color, which is a, U, uh, a, a visual and UV reflectance. This is also that same flower under UV light. Many flowers actually uh, reflect UV responsive patterns. And that's because many insects, including hoverflies, can actually detect UV cues while our human eye cannot. So flowers look very different to them than they do to us. So those could be cues that they could use to identify suitable pollinating flowers. This is also a cue they could use. This is the humidity being released from a flower. Humidity is a very good indicator of the amount of pollen and nectar that a flower might contain, which is of course what these flies are interested in. So they can use humidity cues. So you have to measure those as well, as well as carbon dioxide and temperature and other sort of what we call abiotic cues. They also, of course, have a smell. Being a chemical ecologist, I'm very interested in the chemosensory cues that they give off. And so this is actually the smell of a primrose. And we can gather that by using the special technique that uses these uh, adsorbent silicon tubes um, directly over the, the flower itself. And that gives us a sense of what cues it's giving off while it's actually in the field and, and, and a viable, interesting object to these flies. So we gathered all of these different different uh, smells and sights and looks and all sorts of things. And, and then we actually had over a million data points 
And what we did then was we relied on basically uh, big data techniques, big data multivariate analysis techniques to help us parse this field of data and be able to identify what are the most important cues or the most common cues that these flies use to identify flowers in Bangalore or in, in the Himalayas or in Sweden. Are they the same types of cues? Do they always like yellow, for example? Or do they always like this particular chemical that's released? What are the cues that they use? And so we had a huge number of points. And we had we used the various analyses, like such as principal components analysis that you hear right, right see right now, or um, partial uh, least squares analysis and OPLS and lots of other things. So we used a lot of lot of different techniques. And then we came up with a series of parameters that seemed to be very interesting to these pollinating flies in different regions of the world. So we had a bunch of cues that seemed to be important to them in each of our regions. And because those cues were physical cues, they were colors and shapes and sizes and smells and things like that, we were able to turn those cues into artificial models, which we used uh, by, by 3D printing. So these are our 3D printed uh, model flowers that were coming out of our statistical analysis from collecting data from these different sites. And as you can see, they look a little bit weird, right? They don't really look exactly like flowers. They sort of look like flowers, but that blue flower is a really weird colored blue. And then there's a flower that's green and flowers are not green, but that's because we weren't trying to recreate actual flowers. Remember that we're trying to recreate the cues that the statistical program suggested to us are important for these hoverflies when they're in different fields. And each one of these flowers is representative of a different location. So a different location in the world. So for example, this blue flower in the front is actually very interesting for flies in Bangalore. And the white flower is very interesting for flies in Sweden, for example. And then we went back and each of these flowers, I should also say, also has smell. I, I hope you can see on your screen that there's some tiny holes in the white 3D printed model. And those holes are actually emitting volatiles at the same intensity and concentration as, the, as a real flower would emit that same chemical signature. So we tested them and they were actually attractive. So very early on, we actually didn't have a 3D printer. So we actually used paper flowers. So this picture is actually a paper model of the same type of flower, the green flower that I showed you before. And lo and behold, these, these pollinators came to our objects, even though they really look nothing like flowers to us. I mean, or they look very strange, right? A green flower is a very strange thing, but it gave us a lot of information. So interestingly enough, um, I'm gonna skip this slide just for, just for brevity. What we found was actually that, that, that certain flowers, flower models that we'd created, this particular yellow model was actually attractive everywhere we tested it in the world. It was attractive in Sweden, it was attractive in the Himalayas, and it was attractive in Bangalore. The white model that was actually developed from Sweden was actually not attractive in Sweden. It was actually attractive only in the Himalayas and Bangalore, which is kind of weird. Uh, and the blue flower, which was a Bangalore flower, was only attractive in Bangalore itself. And what this showed us was that while these cues are the same and the species was the same and they, they were present in all of these different environments and very much therefore had similar neural machinery from which to process these cues, they process them very differently as different objects depending on where they were in the world, which shows that identifying objects is not just a product of the object itself, it's also a product of where the object is in the world. And also, of course, what your condition is when you're detecting that object. So ecology and the environment has a very big effect on object identification. Now, I wanna take this question a little bit further and talk about this particular model right here. This is the this is the Sikkim, the Sikkim positive model. And I'm gonna to go to my second question that I raised. And this is that object identification is also shaped by an organism's physiology and current state. So I just talked to you about how where the object is in the world actually matters to how you identify it, but it also matters what you are like at that particular time. And to do this part of the, the analysis, I want to take this particular object. There's a lot of cues associated with this object, right? And this was the object that was attractive everywhere in the, that we tested it in, in 
the different places in the world. Um, it's also, we found it to be attractive also in Australia. It's also attractive in the United States. We've tested in other contexts even more, and it seems to be attractive almost anywhere. But it's actually a complex object. It looks pretty simple, but it has smell, it has shape, it has reflectance, it has size. There's a lot of attributes it has associated with it. So what is it about this object that is actually really, really attractive to these flies? So to answer that, we have to break down the object. And so understanding what an object actually is composed of is a really interesting question. That is a question that as a, as a biologist, um, I had the trouble thinking about, like what is, a, what is a colorless flower? We thought, well, maybe a colorless flower is a black flower, but that's not really colorless because black is also, you know, has, has some absorbance. So that's not really correct. What about a shapeless flower? So we actually end up turning not to biologists to help us come up with these different perturbations of the object, but actually to artists. So we worked with Shristi School of Design which is actually very close to us in Bangalore to help us come up with perturbations of this initial flower object and see how it affected the preference of the flies to understand what it is about the object that they really think is important. And they came up with all these interesting perturbations. And because these looked really cool and we had like actually fractal based models that looked really wacky and things like that, it actually came to the attention of an art gallery, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So actually our flowers became an art exhibit in London out of this, which I thought is really wild. I never thought as a scientist, I would actually have an art exhibit, but that's because, you know, these flowers looked really interesting to people. And I had an interesting question over what is a, you know, what is a flower to an insect? And so that, that actually was very thought provoking to people and it became an exhibit. So this is work with a DT, and, and I, I'm, I hope you can actually see this video. I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it, but I hope you can. So I'm going to play it. Uh, let me see if it's... Uh, yeah, I think this is actually not, it's a, not a video here. This is just a, a picture. So what she did was she compared these different objects to each other. She compared the original object, which was had all of the cues present, all the shape and color and the smell of this very attractive model flower. And she also then perturbed at least one cue at a time. And so then she observed how the insects behaved. So here you can see a, a hoverfly doing its job hovering. I hope you can see it on your screen. Um, and you can see it actually is flying around and inspecting these different objects. And by observing how it behaves to these different objects, we could make we could be able to understand whether it found the object interesting or attractive or not. It would also land on the object as well. And so we always compared our model object with a single cue being perturbed. So I'll give you an example of how we did this. For example, is this object attractive innately? Innately means from birth. So we wanted to know what makes this object attractive. Is it something that is attractive when flies have never before seen a flower or do they need to have some experience of the world? So we took newborn flies that we'd collected and brought back to the lab from the field and let them emerge in a cage where they'd never before seen flowers or smelled flowers. Because I want to tell you, these flies actually grow up in cow dung. So their experience of flowers only comes after they visit a flower as adults. They have no experience of flowers up to that point. And we gave them the choice between our flower and as far as we could really get from a flower, which is that it had no smell, it had no uh, a very different shape. It was a it was a round symmetrical object still, but it had a very different shape. It had a very different reflectance spectrum. It, you know, it, as many cues as we could, could get from the original object, just to see actually if it's even attractive at all, for, or whether it just becomes attractive just because it's a new thing that they've never seen before. And we found that when flies are first born and they have no experience of flowers, they are very, very much attracted to this object compared to another object that has different cues. And that suggests to us that indeed this object seems to be attractive from birth. Now we can do the experiments. What is it about the object that is important? So we did lots of perturbations. We actually took the object in the in this top left corner and we changed the cues, uh, the reflection to the opposite reflective spectrum. So we changed the color. We also changed the contrast by making it gray and we also changed the contrast by making it much more dull colored. We changed the symmetry, we changed the shape, 
we made the smell a changing concentration because the, the intensity of the smell may be important. And we changed the smell altogether. We made it smell like a leaf. We made it smell like bananas. And then we made it smell like cow dung, which is actually something that they would really like, but of course not as a flower, but as something to lay their eggs on. And here's what we found. When Aditi did these experiments, she found that only 27% of the flies would go to a blue flower, which means color does seem to be important in them deciding what a flower is. Same with contrast. They were, they were very, uh, they, they much preferred the original object versus when you perturbed it. Symmetry also was pretty important. If you started to perturb the shape of the flower, especially making it asymmetrical, that seemed to decrease their preference for it. But the changing the, the, the shape in terms of getting rid of the, what are, these are called disruptive edges, these angles here. When you just made it a hexagon, that didn't seem to matter. So the, sh the shape is important to some extent, but not completely. Then we made the, the, the smell a lot less concentrated. That made some difference, but not, not a massive difference, not as much of a difference as, as the color or the, the, the symmetry. Changing the smell didn't seem to have much difference at all. They didn't seem to care. 50% of them would go to a, a flower that smelled like a banana, which means that the identification of the smell is, is not completely important. However, when we made it smell like poop, if they were male flies, they didn't seem to care, but female flies really cared. They really, really did not like the flower when it smelled like poop, which means it can't smell like cow dung, even though cow dung is a really important smell for them that they're attracted to in other contexts. So it's not only what, what, uh, what, where the, the object is placed in the world, but what is the context? And in fact, what is the physiological state? Because both male and female flies actually go to flowers, but you can see that the male flies had a completely different response. They didn't really care about this object, whereas the female flies really cared. So this is a flower to a fly. Basically, this is what a flower is. It has contrast with its background. It has some color. It has symmetry. It has some odor, but not every odor. And it has to have a specific context. So it can't be like an object that. I see somebody has their hand raised. Um, I, I can take the question now. Shriram, is there is any question because your mic was, I mean. Someone had raised their hand, I think. Let me see. No, no, sorry, it's not me. I was just enjoying the talk. I, I, I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. So, Shannon, so, I have so... a question. Sorry, I didn't know like you allowed. So I have a small question, Shannon. Is it fine? I can ask now? Yep, absolutely. That's why I stopped. Okay, so I mean, see, you, you have collected tons of data, like where you have the same set of experiments being conducted in the nature as well as in the laboratory. And you know, yes. nowadays, this recent, I mean, you also mentioned in your initial talks about the inner state of the fish, uh, uh, about yes. the insects, like the inner state, I mean, you're talking about, I'm going a little bit into like the molecular part, like the whether the fly is stressed, unstressed, or so on. Yes. So, and yes. also there, for example, when you catch a fly from the wild and bring it to the laboratory, all his food habits and everything get changed. It's not more or less like, you know, wild type. Correct. So how, so it creates a lot of variance in the data. So how yeah. do you tackle such sort of issues? Yes, so that's a very important point. So I should have I should have emphasized this. I mentioned it in the, a couple of slides earlier. All of these experiments are done on on newborn flies. So meaning that they have just emerged, um, they're perfectly healthy, but they have never had any experience in the outside world. So this would be as close to their naive innate preference for these objects as we can get. As soon as they have experience with objects, they start to change their preference. So one of the things that we did, um, I'm not gonna show that, that data today, is we went through a series of learning trials with them. For example, what if we start making this flower that they're very attracted to from birth, what if we start making it taste bad or where we present quinine? So quinine is bitter not only to humans, but to flies. So will can we teach them to to um, uh, 
dislike something that they are literally born to prefer, right? They're born with a preference for this object. So what happens when we try to make it uh, um, repellent to them? And the, the answer is they can learn to, to, to uh, avoid this object, but it takes a long time. Whereas if you take a neutral object, like the blue flower, which is not attractive. I mean, if they have a choice between a blue flower and a yellow flower, they much prefer the yellow flower from birth, but you can make the blue flower attractive if you give it sugar. So if you put sugar on it, then they'll, then they'll say, oh, blue is a good thing. And they'll start going to blue flower pretty quickly, but you can easily change that preference. That preference is easily mutable, but the preference for this object is not very easily mutable. They cannot be changed from this very, very easily. So this is um, an important question because imagine that you're an animal, and this is something I didn't mention up to now. The way we learn about our world as humans is we learn it from our social environment, our parents, our families, our siblings, the people we grow up with in our house teach us what is food and what is, you know, what is good to eat, and what is bad to eat. And we experience it a bit ourselves. Babies are constantly putting things in their mouth to experience their world and try to understand what is edible and not and things like that. But insects don't have that luxury. Many insects, in fact, most insects are not social, which means that when they're born, there is nobody there to teach them what the world is like. And that means they have to have innate abilities to detect specific objects that are important to them. A flower fly, a hover fly has to find food within a few hours of birth or it will die. And since its food happens to be flowers, it better know what a flower is. If it doesn't know what a flower is, then it's gonna actually die. So this is really what we're trying to get at is what is this instinct for an object that they need to know about from birth? And it's actually a very complex object, right? They're not just looking for a particular smell or a particular color because those wouldn't really reliably tell you what a flower is. But the, this combination of cues seems to be enough for them to be able to identify flowers. And then immediately, as you noted, they start modulating their preferences and their based upon what their experience is, whether they're hungry, what type of food they've gotten, how far they've flown, all of these things then start to have an impact on this preference. But this is really looking at what is their brain programmed by its by its neur neurons to, to tell it what a flower is when it's first born. So I, I hope Got that it. sort of addresses that question. So, yeah. so one small another question. So in the complex slide where you have dissected each and every layer of the complexity, where you have changed yeah. the shapes and all this. It was really wonderful. So one yeah. thing which immediately popped up in my mind is like there is something called what you get and what you get, ex what you are expecting and suddenly you get. So something like, you know, expectation versus reality. So yes, do correct. you think it has some sort of relevance in the uh, higher order processing in the brain? Like, you know, the organisms using certain set of neurons like in the cortex or something where they are thinking of, I mean, in mammalian cortex. So where they are basically thinking like, okay, looking at the phenotypes, they were thinking, okay, this is going to happen. But at the same time, when they really explored the area, they found something else. So are you also exploring? In other words, are you also looking into their nervous system regarding this? Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing right now. So for example, we're looking at since... So, so the one thing to, to keep in mind is that these, these objects that were less preferred aren't necessarily repellent, right? They're just not as preferred. So they could be neutral to the fly, or they could be just, you know, just something that they don't really recognize as anything interesting. But like I said, that blue flower, which is not preferred from birth, we can easily make it preferred if we give it sugar. Right. So then they can like, which means they can number one, see the object, they can process the information. And two, we can actually make that information relevant to them by giving them a reward. So those are the types of experience we're really looking at now. And primarily we're trying to look at first, how are they putting this information together? It's still not really well understood in the insect brain, how they put together visual and olfactory information where that happens and especially for innate objects like this how is that information stored because like i said it's a very complex object right this is actually a lot of different cues so this is not something simple like just being able to, to have one channel for a single odor or, or you know just a single wavelength of light it's actually multiple cues and they do have quite a breadth 
uh, in it. And it's not just a specific odor. As I told you, we could make the flower smell like leaves and it was still attractive. So this is exactly what we're doing right now with um, with some electrophysiology, but it's just gotten started. So unfortunately I don't have anything very cool to tell you right from that standpoint. <laughs> Okay, thanks, okay. thanks, Shannon. I think you can continue if nobody else has questions. Okay, I'll, I can take questions again at the end. Um, so another thing that I, I, I a point I like to bring up because it's actually a it's actually a really relevant point right now. And um, I mean, considering that we're currently under this enormous crisis, this worldwide pandemic that we're dealing with, which was, which is actually in large part has been brought about by the, the world, how much the world is changing. It's also something that's really important to our lab to keep in mind, because while we were doing our experiments um, in different places in the country, it's impossible not to observe how quickly uh, India's landscape is changing. You know, it can be changing from increasing drought and, and things like climate change to land use change to changes in air pollution or water pollution. But we are changing our world so quickly, especially in India. And, and as someone who's interested in how animals process their environment, it's a, it's a very interesting thing to wonder, how are they gonna process objects in a world that's completely different than the world they evolved to live in? So this is something that we've wanted to look at. And for this, we actually go back to the Himalayas. It's beautiful if you've ever been to Sikkim. It's a, it's a, just a fantastic region, but it's also a, a, an extremely vulnerable one. So, uh, you know, it, it, the Himalayas are considered to be one of, if not the most vulnerable locations in the world for climate change, just because they're so delicate in terms of the, the temperature fluctuations and, and, and humidity and, and precipitation fluctuations. And so it's a really big issue to, to try to understand how this changing environment actually may affect such, such uh, long, long evolutionary relationships like insects and flowers. This is a question that was looked at by Joy Sri Chanam. She is a postdoc actually with my next door neighbor in, in the lab at, at NCBS. Um, his name is Mahesh Sankaran and he studies climate change. And we just thought it would be fun to work together and see how all of our work on object identification might be affected by climate change. So Joy Sri worked between 2,500 and 4,500 meters in elevation in the Himalayas. And at those elevations, the average temperature decreases by two degrees with every 500 meters. And two degrees is kind of this magic number, right? It's this number that you often hear talked about by climate scientists, because it is the temperature change at which we start to see drastic effects on, on environments and ecosystems. And just along with the temperature change, also other things like UV radiation, nitrogen fixation, humidity, and all sorts of other factors are also changing. But yet the flowers there, you can find at all of these different elevations and you can find the pollinators at all these elevations. So we wanted to see how are their preferences changing depending on which elevation they're at. So she looked at a series of these four different species of meadow flowers that were found at all of these different elevations. And she collected the odors from them. She found that the, the physical cues didn't change that drastically. The, the excuse me, the, the visual cues, not physical. The visual cues didn't seem to change so much, but we were interested to see how the smells actually change. So we have strawberry, buttercup, and these two other local species, Bistrota and Lysmachia. She collected the volatiles from all of them at all of these different elevations. And here's what she found. Okay, so this is a principal components analysis. So this gives you some idea of how well grouped the, uh, the flower volatiles are at each of these different elevations. And, and I hope you can see that for these three different floral species, the groupings of the volatiles fall along with the elevation, which means all the flower volatiles collected at 3,000 meters cluster together, but they're very, very much separated from the volatiles at 3,500 right here, or 4,000. You see they separate from each other. And what this tells us is actually that these flowers, while they're the same species, are actually giving out entirely different volatile profiles at, at, when they're 500 meters apart from each other. Not only are the concentrations of the volatiles changing, which one might expect because of the atmospheric changes happening, but even the types of volatiles that they're putting out are changing. And this is true for all of the different species we looked at. 
this was really shocking to me, okay, as a, as a biologist and somebody who studied olfaction for her entire career, because I'd always learned, you know, this old adage by Shakespeare that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but in fact, that doesn't seem to be the case, right? Rose can smell very differently depending on where you're growing it. And there hadn't really been a lot of studies that have looked at this to this point. So this was pretty surprising to us and we didn't expect it to happen. So the obvious question is now, do the pollinators care about these changes? Do they make any changes in their behavior since I've been working on this, these hoverflies and these other pollinators? So we did the same experiment that we did for the previous study where we made model flowers. But in this case, we actually tried to replicate the flower as much as possible. So this is our little model strawberry. Isn't it cute? It's a very cute little flower. And it has the same smell as a flower at different elevations. So what we did was we made a strawberry flower that smelled like a flower at 3,000 meters, a flower that smelled like a flower at 3,500 meters, and a flower that smelled like a strawberry flower at 4,000 meters. And then we presented them back in these environments at each of these different elevations. And this work was done by Gowrie, and she's just getting started. And unfortunately, we couldn't repeat this experiment this year. You know why, right? Field work is incredibly difficult to do when there's a pandemic. So we don't have the, the follow-up experiment to that. But basically, what she found was that these different flowers do actually smell very different to these flies at different elevations. And the flowers that are, so what this graph is actually the visits to these artificial flowers. So each of these on the x-axis is where we did the experiment. We did the experiment at 3,000, 3,500, 4,000 meters. What these colored bars indicate are what are the preferences to the flower that comes from that elevation. So this is the preference to a 3,000 meter replicated flower at 3,000 meters. Here's the preference at a 3,000 meter flower done at 3,500 and done at 4,000. And as you can see, they're not the same. The preferences are not different for individual flowers and the number of visits we got to them. Um, and we repeated this over several days and with several, several different insects. And we're not sure why this is, you know, maybe the physiology of the fly is changing. That's something that Gowrie is trying to work on now. It could be that also that the, the flower itself is, is producing different, releasing different cues because of the environment that it's in. So we're continuing these experiments now, but it shows to us that the changing world is actually having a drastic impact on the objects themselves. And, and we're not sure if the, the insects can keep up to that, right? It may be, it maybe could potentially be dangerous for their ability to detect these objects efficiently in the future if they continue to really profoundly alter what the object looks and smells like, and those cues are important. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, um, and probably the most fun for this crowd, is that, uh, you know, not only is the object changing because the world is changing and not only is the object going to have a different context depending on where you are in the world and not only does it change depending on how how the physiological state of the animal is you know whether it's naive or hungry or sleepy or whether it's a male or a female whether it's ready to lay to lay eggs or mate but also you need to find the object in a world that's really, really, really complicated. And we take it for granted, but there's a lot of things going on. Every, every time you look, if you look out your window right now, there's so many things that you can, you can see with your eyes. It's very complicated and it's very stochastic, right? It's constantly changing. So this becomes an incredibly computational, computationally difficult problem for artificial systems right now, which is why we really suck at having unmanned uh, artificial vehicles being able to find objects on their own. It's just really difficult for them because they have to do it in very complex environments. And a lot of times the objects are partially occluded or there's, there's other obstacles in the way. And so it becomes very difficult to do this. And we became very interested in how insects can identify these objects. How can they do this when the world is so different? And we have a very big problem with an insect, which is that you can't follow a fly around. We've tried. I don't know if you've tried. It's very, very hard to do. You can probably follow them around for a little while, but you can't track them with GPS. They're too small for that. And you also, even if you can track them, you don't exactly know 
what it is that they're seeing and smelling and feeling at any one point in time, right? You can sort of estimate it, but you can't truly know, did they, did they get a packet of odor at that exact moment? Is that why they turned left? So because we can't actually monitor the insect as it's traveling through the world, we try to monitor the world as the insect is staying in place. And we do that with virtual reality. So this is a technique that we, um, we've we been working on in the lab for almost five years. Um, it's actually very hard to create a universe for an insect, despite what you may think. Um, and this was done by Pavan Kaushik. I, I call him the, the, the Weltgeber. It means the world giver in, in German. <laughs> so because he actually made a made a world for a fly. And uh, and this is what it looks like. OK, so this is what the the environment for the fly looks like. So we have, of course, the fly. It is tethered. Um, it is alive. OK, and it's tethered by having a small amount of super glue on its back, on, right between it, the equivalent of its th its uh, shoulder blades. So it's called a prothorax. Um, this doesn't hurt the fly. It immobilizes it so it can only it can't run a fly away or run away. But it, it actually um, you can detether it afterwards and it can go along its merry way and survive and mate and have babies. Um, we also have a camera that can film the fly's behavior as it's tethered. It can still fly. It can move its wings and legs, but it can't actually make any um, translational um, uh, movement. We have a panoramic display. Insects can see almost in 360 degrees, so that's why we couldn't easily put goggles on them. So we had to give them a virtual reality screen that actually wrapped around them in 360 degrees. And we have wind and odor. Uh, insects fly and they determine where to find the odor by the wind and they determine where to go at long distances because they can't see very well from a very far distance by smelling. Very important. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, all right. So, so here's how we observe our insects identifying objects in our virtual reality. So here we have the view that the insect would see on the screen. It looks a little distorted because remember, this is actually wrapped around them in 360 degrees. So this is what it looks like as an unwrapped field. And you can see it looks a little bit strange. And that's because, um, because in, when it's wrapped around, it actually, the, the contrast of the sky has much more uniformity and other things. Things. Here we have the fly here, and what we measure what, in order to determine where it wants to go in our virtual world is by how it beats its wings. So if you're in the, in, in the river or in a lake and you're trying to swim, the way that you go to the left is that you swim harder on your right, and the way that you go to the right is you swim harder on your left, and we observe the same thing in our insects. So we determine where they want to go by measuring their wing beat amplitudes, and that tells us which way they want to steer, and we move the world in response to that. Over here is what the trajectory of the insect would look like. And this is in meters. So this is actually the number of meters it would be traveling in the real world and the trajectory it's taking. So this dot is the fly and this dot is the tree. And here's what it looks like when it travels. So you can see this fly is navigating directly to this tree. Um, and, and it's actually flying in and out of the branches of the tree. And every time it gets really close to the tree, and I'll show you this when, when this, uh, this repeats this video. This is a, 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 an actual video it's taken without cropping. You can see when it comes really close, you see it throws its legs out right here. It's throwing its legs out because an insect does this as it's approaching an object at very close range, either to avoid hitting it like an obstacle like you would do, you'd throw out your arms to avoid hitting something, or because it wants to land. It also has to throw out its landing gear. So this is a way we knew that it's actually keeping, uh, it's able to detect these virtual items as actual objects. It's thinking that they are actual objects because it's behaving towards them as it, as it would to a real object in the real world. And using this, we were able to test a lot of different features. One, we were able to ask a question, which is at what maximum distance will a flying insect respond to an object of interest? 
This is actually a really interesting question because it's not a question of acuity. If you go to an eye doctor, right, there's a difference between you being able to say, yeah, I see something there. And yeah, I know what letter it is, right? So that's a very different thing. You can actually see that something is there way before you can actually tell what it is. So this is the question we're asking is not if and not if they can detect objects, but how far away do they see them as behaviorally relevant to them? So we did this for actually a whole number of insects, not just for our flies, but we did this to things like mosquitoes and, and, and mosquitoes actually, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna play this video again. I hope you can see this video okay. So mosquitoes are actually able to go towards these objects. You can see there's an, a mosquito, a male mosquito navigating towards a tree. They're actually pollinators, so they actually will often go and sit in trees um, and wait for females as well. And you can see it actually behaving towards a tree just like the, the, the apple fly would. And we did this also with crane flies, and we did this also with our hover flies, but of course, then we used flowers instead of trees for them. And by doing this, we actually were able to measure at what distance away were they still able to respond. And for example, for the apple fly, you can see here in this figure on the right, here's just their response to these objects for the different species. The response to the right is, if you can see at a distance of 24 to 32 meters, they no longer accurately respond to that object. But they do when it's between 16 and 24 meters, which suggests to us that 24 meters is about the distance for the four meter sized tree that we were using, at which they can accurately identify and behaviorally respond to it. We don't know at which distance they can see that. We can actually measure that just by physiological parameters of their eyes, their compound eyes, and what they should be able to have for acuity. But this is actually their behavioral response. So this is very interesting because actually this is very relevant to a lot of uh, scientists who are interested in how insects actually respond to very various uh, uh, traps, let's say, if they're an insect pest, or how, how far apart you should set out your crops so that the pollinators will most efficiently reach them. So understanding how far away they should they can be before responding becomes extremely important for these different ecological parameters. So we also looked at how they can actually determine where things are in the world. Okay, so we looked at things like perspective and motion parallax. Um, I'll explain motion parallax with this video. I, 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 maybe some of you know about it, but I always find it's much easier to, to, to explain visually. So, um, so I'll just pause this here. Okay, so here you can see two trees, I hope one on the left and one on the right. And right now they look pretty much identical, right? To me, they look they look absolutely identical. They look identical in size, identical in shape, identical in distance. I can't tell the difference. But as we start to approach the two trees, you can see that the tree on the left is obviously much closer and the tree on the right is much farther away, but it was also twice as big. So when we started the experiment, they looked to be the same size. So only through the motion of us in the world were we able to distinguish the size and the, sh and the, the distance of the object. So this requires us to use both perspective and both this phenomenon known as motion parallax. It was known that insects could do this while walking, but it was not known whether they could do this from flying. But Pavan found that indeed, they were able to distinguish a tree that was closer but, but smaller versus a tree that was farther away. And they would always go to the closer tree, even though when they started the experiment, those two trees were exactly the same look and shape. And this shows to us that they can indeed use, use motion parallax in order to determine where, where and how far away distance the objects are in the distance. And this is really important to understand how they process visual information. The last thing, the last two are whether they can use wind cues and also whether they can use odor cues to in order to locate objects. So we also tested them um, to how they were able to, to distinguish odor cues. And I'm not sure if my sound will work here, 
um, from my computer. So what I'm going to show you is this is how they we tested how they responded to order cues. So in this case, we don't didn't give them any object to behave towards. We just gave them odor. And odor travels through the air in something called a plume, which means that it's actually a stochastic bunches, packets of odor molecules that come in small bunches, and they generally increase in frequency as you get closer to the object. Okay, but it's a bit stochastic in how they spread and how they travel through the air. But animals we know are able to use the wind direction and also use the, the packet information, the frequency and nature of those packets in order to reach the odor source, which is a flower or an animal or whatever they're interested in. So in this case, we wanted to know if they could actually pay attention to these odor packets alone. So we have a special apparatus uh, in this virtual reality that allows us to give frequency pulse stimulation. And we can do this at regular frequencies or we can do it at, at changing frequencies depending on where the animal is in the world. So here is what the animal will, uh, the fly will look like. And you can see here all these um, these different uh, 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 capillaries around it. And each of these capillaries can give out the odor. So the odor, odor can also be directional as well. So this allowed us to present the odor from any direction and at any frequency we wanted to, up until about 20 hertz was the limitation of our equipment that we had. And so what I'm going to do is when I play this video is you're going to see a light. I don't know if you'll hear the sound. I'm not sure if the sound will come through, but you'll at least see this bar light up. And each time it light up, lights up, the insect will be getting a stimulation. And it will get the stimulation only when it's facing in one direction. When it turns away, it wouldn't get that stimulation. So in that way, it can actually travel in an odor plume, a virtual odor plume that we're creating for it. And you can see what it does here. So here you can see it's getting odor. And as the frequency starts to increase, it actually keeps traveling towards that increasing frequency. And now it's reached a certain frequency where it starts searching for the source of the odor because uh, and then performing a local search behavior because it's, it's at such a high frequency that there must be something there that's producing the odor. And now it's wandered off and it's gone out of the odor. And now it can't find the odor again, so it's doing what we call a casting behavior, where it's trying to search for the odor, and then eventually the fly will find its way back to the odor source, and we'll start looking again. This is a real-time video, so it takes a little while. <laughs> Still looking. Now, now it's come back exactly to where it was and started searching. Pretty cool, huh? Because it's actually not a real odor there. There's no real object there. This is all happening in virtual reality. So using this technology, it really can help us to try to understand how they parse this information and what is the stochastic nature of both visual and olfactory and actually mechanosensory information for them. So, so this is what we're doing right now. We're continuing with these experiments. We hope at some point to be able to couple them with neurological experiments and see how they're actually processing this information. Lots of people across the world are using virtual reality. We're not the first lab to do this. We're just the first lab to, to do this kind of more, let's say, um, uh, pseudo-realistic virtual reality, where we actually present th you know, three-dimensional objects and odors and, and cues together. Um, most of the other virtual realities are, are more interested and how, how the neurological processing is happening. So they're presenting gradients and, and single odors. So we went, you know, we were interested in what the animals are doing outside. So that's why we presented the odors with the, the visual stimuli this way. I think with that, I will stop because it's been, I think, almost an hour that I've been talking. So I just want to thank these are all the different funding organizations that have helped us across the years for these different projects. And I also really want to thank Karin, who was a big help to us, uh, Karin Nordstrom, who I mentioned during the talk, and also Jeff Fader, who has been working with me on the, the fly project with the virtual reality. So he's been actually providing us with the flies and helping us a lot with understanding their ecology. So, and of course, the lab that I work on were fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon, for wonderful talk. I mean, I really enjoyed it. And I think many of the others, colleagues and
students have also enjoyed it it's just very informative very i mean i have no better words to describe that very wonderful work so first let's start with the students because i think uh, so anyone in the students wants to ask questions please or anyone in general wants to ask some questions please ask They are asleep. <laughs> okay, one by one. Anybody can start, please. I'm one of the PhD students in the department. Uh, so, from the findings so far, are we able to draw any parallel to the human behavior? So, I mean, obviously, obviously um, and one of the things that I, I, I didn't mention during the talk, um, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, insects have much simpler brains, right? I mean, the insects that we work on, the flies we work on, have between 200,000 to 300,000 neurons in their brain, and the human brain has 80 billion. So obviously, the computational capacity of the human brain far, far exceeds what an insect can do. But despite that, they still have to do a lot of the same things, right? They still have to find food. They have to avoid getting, getting eaten by a predator. They have to be able to avoid obstacles. They have to be able to navigate. In a, in, a, in a constantly changing environment, but they managed to do this with only a couple hundred thousand neurons. So, so the the advantage of using experiments is that really fundamental behaviors we talk about, like being able to um, judge distance and perspective and, and, and being able to uh, follow odors and being able to put information together like the hoverflies do. Those have to be done by the human brain as well, but you can study them in a much more tractable nervous system like an insect. So that's why we do it. So there are similarities. Of course, there's similarities. You know, insects process odor information in a very similar manner to, to the way humans do. We have a very similar um, structure of our, of our olfactory system, at least at the initial levels. Um, we, the insects also have a, a equivalent to a visual cortex as well. So of course, computationally, it's much more limited. But there are, are a lot of parallels you can make. And understanding these fundamental behaviors really lie at the heart of understanding the human brain as well. Swapna, you had a question. I mean, you were asking. Yeah. Some... So, hi, Shannon. I'm Swapna. I'm a visiting faculty and Ramanujan fellow at IIITD. And I do work with insects. I'm an evolutionary ecologist. So, your topics are very close to my heart as well. Uh, I have a quick question about uh, uh, the response of hoverflies to uh, these different cues. And uh, specifically because you mentioned that in females you found something and probably males didn't respond. So um, I wanted to know, did you find more plasticity in such uh, male females or other castes that, um, in insects that you have worked with? So that was the only difference we found be between males and females was in the fact because the females are the ones that actually lay eggs, um, obviously. Uh, and, and, but, but interestingly, the males also generally go to dung piles um, in order to find the females. So it's not that the males are not interested in the odor of dung as well, but it, it was interesting to us that that was the only difference that we found was that, that when, when a flower smelled like dung when it had a smell that it was no longer attractive to females but males didn't seem to care they seemed to be like okay it's a it's a dung smelling flower um you know and and why this is that's that's exactly like i said that's what we're trying to figure out right now but we didn't find a huge amount of difference otherwise at least in in the sex or in the uh, physiological condition of the flies, not whether they were mated or unmated or these kind of things. Obviously, if they were not hungry, they didn't really look for flowers at all. So, I, I mean, because the flowers are their food source. So that was always a factor. If they were a satiated fly, they just wouldn't, but they wouldn't move, right? They would just sit there and they wouldn't right. do anything for yeah. experiments. So we, we had to make sure they were hungry. But again, hunger also is an interesting thing because, um, 
we had to starve them for a very specific length of time. Um, obviously, you couldn't starve them too much until they were, you know, unable to behave. But also, there was seemed to be a critical period where they would go from being a little bit selective to actually just being very erratic in their behavior. We noticed that if we starved them for uh, more than 12 hours, they became kind of frantic. I, I'm sorry, this is not a very technical term, but they just kind of flew around all over the place and they didn't seem to really be able to make any decisions um, at all. So, so we noticed that actually starving them for a very short period of time, two to four hours, where they were just, you know, which they could normally handle because in nature, they would definitely not be eating all the time. Um, then, then that seemed to be okay to get to get very robust behaviors. But beyond that, they started to act very erratically in our experiments. Okay. okay. Did you also try some conditioning? Uh, yes. Habituating yes. Them? Okay. Absolutely. So we did. So, so I didn't go through those those experiments today, but but I, I briefly mentioned that we we also went on to do a, a several uh, uh, conditioning experiments with them. We wanted to know, you know, how number one, could we get them, as I said, could we could we get them to avoid an object that is innately preferred? Um, and and how robust is that avoidance behavior and how long lasting is it? Um, and so we did a series of experiments where we looked at the, you know, how uh, the learning curve, like how extensive the learning curve was for them to uh, learn to avoid something if we gave it a bad, uh, a, a repellent taste with quinine. We looked at how quickly they could learn other objects, right? Could they, could they learn to go to an object that didn't look anything like a flower? like a gray, the gray disc I showed you that really doesn't look anything like a flower. And of course, if we give them sugar, they will learn that as an object. So, so they have very plastic behavior, which you would expect, right? Because flowers have all different shapes and colors and sizes in the natural world. So our question wasn't wasn't so much, at least initially, how well can they learn? Because we know that insects are fabulous learners. The experiments have shown us this, for example. But whether well, how do they find a flower when they're just born? Because then nobody's there teaching them what it is. So what is the information that they need? Because flowers are so diverse and there are so many colors and shapes and smells. So, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you so much. I enjoyed your talk and uh, I'll be in touch with you. I'll oh, talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Good, I would appreciate that. Thanks. So, anybody else have any questions? Guys, students? Anyone? Okay. Looks like, I mean, no, I, there is also one point. You explained it so linearly, so even I understood majority of the parts. So, <laughs> so it was really wonderful talk. So, if there are any no questions, so I think it's good, like we can discuss. And Shannon, I will contact you on the phone now after this. Thank you, Shannon, once again. And it was really Thank wonderful. So like, Yes, I hope I hope we, after this you will you will think about how important nature is no matter what you do. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. So thank you, Shannon. So we can leave now. Thanks a lot. Bye, thank you.